Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the fourth quarter of 2013. This series of lessons <coughs> is focusing on the sanctuary. And this is lesson number four in that series for October 26 of 2013. If you found these lessons challenging so far, so far, so have we. We hope that you've enjoyed the materials we've talked about. If you're interested in looking at the handouts that we look at as, as we do our discussions, uh, they're available on our website. The website is www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X. It stands for Theological Crossroads. Theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. There's a lot of scripture material in these lessons, so you need to have your Bible handy. We're going to be jumping around fairly quickly, so you might need to be fast. But uh, I hope you have your Bible on hand by now. And if you, ha if you don't, and if you want to look at these lessons more than once, they're available on our website. You can see the audio and you can see the video if you choose. But let's pray now and jump into our lesson. Our wonderful Father is... We consider the ways in which so long ago you sought to teach your children recently escaped from slavery there at the foot of Mount Sinai. Help us to realize the, the lessons, to put them in the proper context, and to realize what they're supposed to mean for us even today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This lesson is going to focus on the design and the function of the ancient tent tabernacle built by Moses and the children of Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai. We will briefly also compare Solomon's temple and Herod's temple. And just as a way of doing that, I'm going to take a moment and have you have a look at a diagram here that will help us to understand that issue. There's a, a, a picture of Solomon's temple. I guess that's as big as I'm going to get it for right now. Let's try doing it this way. There's a, a little bit of Solomon's temple. You get a little idea of what it looked like. Then I'm going to... Do I point out some things there? Yes. If you would like, that we can do that. Um, let me point out some things that people don't understand or don't know about this. Uh, for one thing, um, you know, here's the stone altar over to the side. You know, you know, Ken, I'm not sure everybody knows the short history of these temples. Maybe it might you be wise about to that? mention, you know, about yeah. the okay. wilderness temple and Solomon's yeah. temple. And okay, the first, for the first temple built by the Jews was what's called the tent tabernacle because they had to be able to fold it up and, and carry it with them as they traveled to the desert. And that was originally constructed at the foot of Mount Sinai in approximately the year 1445 B.C. It was right after they left uh, Egypt. Right, uh, right after they, they left Egypt. Right after God had given, appeared on Mount Sinai and given them the Ten Commandments, the next thing basically they did was start working on this the sanctuary, this tent tabernacle. About 400 years later, 400 and some, a few more, uh, Solomon uh, was given the materials by his father David to construct what we call what we call Solomon's temple, and it looked like this. You see a bit of a cutaway drawing there, and we don't have time to talk about all of it. But basically, there is a there was a stone altar. This is where the sacrifices were, were, were offered up here. There's a molten sea here. This is where the, the priests would come to um, do various things. And, and, and there, were some time, there were some smaller labors and basins. This is a place where they would clean hands and feet and so forth before they went into the tabernacle, etc. This is in Jerusalem. This is now, yes, on the top of Mount Moriah in Jerusalem where the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim uh, memorial, is now, is now located. This temple was destroyed at the time when, when Nebuchadnezzar 
conquered Jerusalem the third time. He said, I'm sick of coming back here and, and, and trying to get these people to, so he says, I'm not going to leave anything that's fit for anybody here. And so he, he wiped out everything. After they came back of the 70 years of captivity, about 15 years later, Haggai and Zechariah stirred them up and convinced them to rebuild a much smaller temple which served for a long period of time until around the year B.C. 40, more or less. And um, at that point in time, Herod the Great came with a lot of money from the Roman Empire to come down there. And once again, the Romans were trying to get the Jews to behave themselves, uh, not cause all, a lot of so much ruckus. And they thought by building a nice big temple, for them, maybe that would keep the Jews satisfied and quiet for a while, and thus was constructed what, what came to be called as Herod's Temple. And um, I'm going to just see in a moment here if I can. We're going to see how high tech works here? Yeah, we're going to see if we can figure out exactly how to do this. Um, So Herod added a lot of square footage to the temple. Yes, he did. A lot of square footage to the temple. And I'm going to have to get out of this, I think, completely in order to get to where I want to go. Um, but I will show you in just a second an important thing that will help us to understand something about these tabernacles. And here is a something to give us an idea of the comparison of sizes and so forth of these various structures. Uh, now, we have we have five structures shown in this in this picture. Uh, here at the bottom uh, right, as you're looking at it, is an American football field to give you a perspective. The tabernacle we're going to mostly talk about today is this one located right over here just above it to the, to the, further to the right. This is the one that was built out in the desert at the foot of Mount Sinai and it had to be taken apart and packed up and carried with them wherever they went. Okay. Solomon's temple built like I already mentioned some 400 years later was somewhat bigger. Here's Solomon's temple. But it was okay. full of gold and it was beautiful. Right. And we'll talk about that more. Okay. <clears throat> A thousand years after that, here is Herod's temple. Quite a bit larger again. But not as beautiful. But not as, no, no not, as, not as elaborately decorated or as beautiful as Solomon's temple. And this is the temple that existed when, this, when Jesus was here. This was the temple that Jesus went into and taught in and all that sort of stuff. And then um, over here we have something that many people are not aware of. The prophet Ezekiel was given a vision near the end of his prophetic book about a future temple and this was never actually constructed but look at how big it was all the dimensions were given etc cetera, etc cetera, and it looked something like something like this how big it was bigger than all these other things put together so that gives you a little bit of a perspective on what this all these different things were okay okay so, and what was the purpose of all of that? What was the purpose of God building a temple? Our memory verse for this week, the people must make a sacred tent for me so that I may live among them. What was the purpose of this sanctuary then? So God could live among us. And we don't have time to read this now, but if you go to Numbers 2, you will discover that the sanctuary was put right in the middle, that the tribe of Levi camped right around the sanctuary, a ways back from it, not immediately crowding it, so there was room around the sanctuary for people to come and worship and so forth. And then 
Three tribes were on this side, three tribes this side, three tribes this side, and three tribes that side. So they were scattered out in a big square there, and that's all described in, in Numbers chapter 2. And that's all through the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. That's what they did. Every time they set up camp, that's what they did. Were the basic uh, temple services, were they pretty well the same throughout all those generations? Uh, the, so long as they were following God's plan, there were a number of times when they significantly departed from God's intentions. And then they were, if you read, if you read Jeremiah down near the end, they, were, they had converted some of these temple rooms into places to worship all kinds of pagan idols and snakes and all kinds of craziness. But yes, when they were doing God's will, yes. You know, <clears throat> God appears to me to be a very organized, orderly mm -hmm. person. Um, yes. Everything in its place, mm -hmm. and he has a system, 333, three, three, and... Yes. Yeah. It was God's intent for this sanctuary to be the center of life and activities for the children of Israel. The worship of God and all the ceremonies connected with it were to be the center of their attention, the most attractive and beautiful part of their lives. And I can tell you that each one of these temples, starting from that relatively small one out there in the, in the wilderness, were absolute, if you could go inside, and presumably, hopefully, someday in heaven we'll be able to at least see a movie, God will show us what they look like. They were gorgeous. I mean, with gold and silver and purple and inwoven stuff, and they were absolutely beautiful. Um, look at a couple of verses. Exodus 13, starting with 21 and, verses 21 and 22. During the day, the Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud to show them the way, and during the night, He went in front of them in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel night and day. The pillar of cloud was always in front of the people during the day and the pillar of fire at night. So what do we have here? There are some others. You could look at chapter 14, verse 24, and Deuteronomy 1, verse 33. What do we observe here? Remember what was hanging over the tent sanctuary when they were camped? What came down and actually hung over the Ark of the Covenant in the Most Holy Place? The pillar was there, wasn't it? The pillar. The God's Shekinah presence. Yeah. So, let me ask you, how would you feel, for example, if next Sabbath you showed up at church and there was God's presence in the form of a fire right over the pastor's podium up in front? I think after a while you'd get used to it. Because That's I, not what I asked you. Well, well <laughs> I think it's a good point because, because that's exactly what happened to them. Yeah. I mean, after 40 years, that thing, that cloud over them, it just, <laughs> big yeah. deal, you know, after a while. Yeah, yeah. no and one else had the cloud around them, so I, I don't see how it could stop being a big deal. Well, I know what you mean by that, but I... You got to see what I mean by it too. Oh, yeah. The way yeah. she, the way you're trying to make the illustration of coming down to the church, it'd be fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, but um, well, and that's the way it should have been at the beginning. And if they had done everything they were supposed to have done, it would have continued to have an enormous impact. I was it? Is it any really much difference today? Um, although we don't have a a glowing presence, isn't. Can't we really, when we look at our lives, can't we see how God is is a, a presence in our life, and we okay. we you well, know we get used to that? And let, let, let's try that, okay? What did the universe, looking on, think when their Creator, the Creator of the entire universe, the one who made everything that was ever made, John chapter one, especially verses one to three, the Lord Himself? came down to dwell among these homeless wanderers in the desert. What does that say to us about harboring ethnic, class, or cultural prejudices? Well, they were saying, God, what are you doing with that scum of the earth? My point? Well, Exodus 40 verses 9 and 10 say something interesting. Then, the, then dedicated 
the tent and all its equipment by anointing it with the sacred oil, and it will be holy. Next, dedicate the altar and all its equipment by anointing it, and it will be completely holy. Also dedicate the wash basin and its ba basis in the same way, and if you go on, you'll found out, find out that the entire sanctuary, step by step, and including the priests, were all dedicated and, 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 and anointed and so forth. What was that all about? What does it mean to be holy? Well, I'm going to read, we're going to read several quotations from Ellen White here that I think will provide some very interesting <coughs> things to talk about. This is, once again, from Patriarchs and Prophets. I'm sorry, this one is from SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 2, page 1010. The typical service, we're talking about the t t what was going on there in that tent, was the connecting link between God and Israel. The sacrificial offerings were designed to prefigure the sacrifice of Christ, and thus to preserve in the hearts of the people an unwavering faith in the Redeemer to come. Hence, in order that the Lord might accept their sacrifices and continue His presence with them, <clears throat> and on the other hand, that the people might have a correct knowledge of the plan of salvation and a right understanding of their duty, it was of the utmost importance that holiness of heart and purity of life, reverence for God and strict obedience to His requirements should be maintained by all connected with the sanctuary. What does that sound like to you? that sound like God had a special plan in mind? Sounds like it didn't work. Well, and that's my next question. Why did God do it this way? What, is, is there any evidence? I mean, do you read in any of these books, okay, now Abraham, I'm, I'm sorry, Abraham, did Moses set them all down and say, okay, now let me explain to you what all this is supposed to mean? If Moses did that, he didn't write it down. No, he didn't write it down at all. Did Where do we get our ideas about what all these things are supposed to mean? Hebrews. From the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. They didn't have the book of Hebrews. Did Moses even know what it meant? Well, I can't, the kind, what I know about God's teaching abilities, I can absolutely not believe that he didn't make some provision for, for spelling this out. He must have been, uh, done whatever he thought was necessary, and way better than what I could think. He must have had made it, made it evident somehow. Well, it was transferred to the writer of Hebrews, so it was well known. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Were there times when the entire group of the children of Israel gathered around the sanctuary to receive instructions from Moses? Do you remember reading about anything like that? May you tell us about it? Well, there, there were times. There were, there were certain uh, times of the year, weren't there, or festivals or something in which um, this happened with Moses. And uh, it seems like, although I can't come up with a text, it seemed like even heads of tribes were supposed to do this in among their tribes and so on and so forth. Go over the these The only things. time that I can think of when it talks about the children of Israel all gathering specifically, now this is maybe not, there might be one other time, but there's one that I can think of, and that was at the time of the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Yeah. What about at the giving of the Ten Commandments? Well, that was before there was any sanctuary. Okay, and then Moses, at the end of his life, gathered uh, in, all, in the, all of them together for, yeah. and basically recounted he, their history. In the he whole preached, book. in the book of Deuteronomy, he preached three, what we might call sermons to them. Well, they're more sermons, more than sermons. They were a recounting of history. their history, everything God had done for them, so forth. And I don't know whether he wrote those down as we have them and then read them to them, or exactly how he, we don't know how that happened. Wasn't there, it seemed like I was reading not too long ago, there was a time when Joshua went, f followed this uh, with him as well. It seemed like toward the end of his, maybe not, maybe I'm confused, but there was did a... Did what? Went over these things with the children of Israel, very much like oh. Moses did, but may maybe, I, maybe I stand corrected there. Okay. He must it? have had a loud <coughs> voice. I wonder how... In the yeah, world. how he got them all to understand. 
What does it mean to be holy? Well, that's the next question. If, if God is going through this elaborate process to, to make holy the sanctuary and the priests, and then what did he say to them? I, I am the Lord your God, and this is Leviticus 11, 44 and 45. I am the Lord your God, and you must keep yourselves holy because I am holy. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt so that I could be your God. You must be holy because I am holy. So what does that mean? Well, what does the word holy mean? Well, holy is a word that derives from the Greek as hagios. Uh, the Latin is sacred or sanctified. It means to be set apart, for and usually it's set apart for some very special purpose. Not common. Not common. Not common, set apart. Yeah. Why, in what sense do you think God intended for the children of Israel to be set apart? Did he want the children to be a reflection of him so that other people in the world would know God by looking at God's children? Do you think that um, the people living in uh, Palestine at that, Canaan at that point in time needed to know something about God? Yes. The gods they were worshiping at that point in time in Canaan were just abominable. I recently came back from a, a trip in the Middle East, uh, well, in, in, in biblical languages, and, and you go to the museums and you see some of the idols that they were worshiping, and it was all focused, I can tell you, on fertility. Now, are you saying when they had the sanctuary in Jerusalem that they were also worshiping other? They weren't supposed to be. But what was were. supposed to happen is the children of Israel were supposed to say, they were supposed to have this contract with God this agreement with God to be different. And they were supposed to be so blessed by God and so obviously different that the whole world would say, what do you have that we need, that we want? They were Talks, examples. They were supposed to be examples to the world. But what happened in actual fact, they started following the practices of all the neighbors around them and pretty soon they were, finally, if you read, if you read, uh, Second Kings 17 and, and Second Chronicles 35 and 36, it says they were worse than, than the Canaanites that, that God drove out to make room for them. Well, to be set apart, you have to be different. Mm -hmm. If everybody in my neighborhood has a Cadillac and I have a Volkswagen, I'm set apart, mm -hmm. aren't I? So, so you, that's, you're leading right into my next question. How does that apply to us today? What, uh, what are we supposed to be set apart from? We're supposed to be a peculiar people, set apart, reflecting, reflecting God. Examples. We're, 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 we live in a world that's mired in sin. We're surrounded by it. Uh, does that mean that somehow or other we're supposed to keep ourselves a little pure, clean spot in the midst of this mud? or? Well, just coming close to God kind of sets you apart, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, what is the most difficult thing for teenagers to do when I was teaching high school is to not to go with the crowd. Yeah. It takes a very strong person yeah. to not go with the crowd. And God is saying, do not go with the crowd because the crowd is going to death, mm -hmm. to hell. You have to be strong and not want to be with the group that you're with. It's sort what? of like those uh, people that um, Gideon had that fought. He, the, the group was just down to a certain few who were very, um, very dedicated. good, very dedicated. And God wants those types of people. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to do. We want to be, yeah. we want to like we think that we need to be like other people or, other, or they won't like us. Well, you want to feel secure. And mm -hmm. if you're with all the other people... And they're like you. Yeah, and you feel secure. And yeah. you don't want to tell them, no, what you're doing is wrong. And well, well, you will if you know for sure what's going to happen if you <laughs> went that way. But uh, you have to well, know it. In this case, Moses was given very detailed, very careful instructions exactly how to construct 
this tabernacle. And he was told that this is modeled after what? The tabernacle in heaven. The tabernacle in heaven. And two men, Bezalel from the tribe of Judah and Aholiab from the tribe of Dan, were actually blessed or given God's spirit to, to make these beautiful pieces of furniture and so forth that were used in this, in this tent tabernacle. Of course, the most important piece of furniture in the tabernacle was what? The ark. The ark. The covenant box. Yeah. Did they make the covenant box? They did. So God really likes these craft people who work with their hands, and he'll give them special talents. And they did a beautiful job. I'm sure we're, when we get to see it someday, we're going to be blown away. And what, above that, well, let's look at that for just a moment. We're, we're going to talk about the Day of Atonement in the future, but inside that ark was what? Ten tables of the Ten the Commandments. The two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments on them. On top was that lid, which is sometimes called a place of, the to of atonement or sometimes called the mercy seat. And above that was God's glorious Shekinah presence. And eventually there was a jar of manna put in there. A manna and Aaron's rod that was budded. We, and, it's, and also the, all, the, the, all five books of Moses were written. And I understand it's hard to, to sort of, I, I think they were somehow hung just on the outside of this Ark of the Covenant. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how that worked. So this week we will focus on the events that took place in the courtyard and in the holy place. The holy place made with hands were to be figures of the true, patterns of things in the heavens. Hebrews 9, 24 and 23. A miniature representation of the heavenly temple where Christ, our great high priest, after offering his life as a sacrifice, was to minister in the sinner's behalf. Patriarchs and Prophets 343.2. Now that should immediately trigger in your mind a couple of major questions. The whole system there in the wilderness was all geared to sacrificing animals. Are we going to be sacrificing animals in heaven? No. What's the point of having a huge altar of burnt offering if there's no burnt offering? Heaven. Well, isn't it, isn't it kind of an illustration of sacrifice is an illustration of not being selfish? Yeah. So there's, that's kind of a central thing, isn't it? And even if there is no, not that kind of sacrifice in heaven, still the concept is still major, yeah. even, even up there. Yeah. Is that why some churches teach there's no sanctuary in heaven? Well, there's is, uh, is the sanctuary a process that God had to go through in order to save humans? So they're we're going we're gonna to talk about those issues in a future lesson. Okay. I don't want to talk. A, we don't have time to talk about them a lot right now. Um, of course, do you have to have a sanctuary for God to dwell with you? Well, that's one of the issues. Because in, 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 in the book of Revelation, it's going to talk about repeatedly, talk about scenes from the sanctuary, and then all of a sudden at the end, and it's going to say there is no temple in heaven. We'll look at that. But, uh, for the future. Yes. Okay. When God called the children of Israel to bring gifts for the construction of that tent tabernacle back in the beginning, they brought some of the most wonderful and expensive gifts one could possibly imagine. And where did they get those gifts? From the Egyptians. The Egyptians loaded them with that stuff and said, get out of our country. Yeah. And this is where they went. I mean, it's interesting to notice that what, most of this gold, where did it come from? Right. Earrings. They were Earrings. Given, <laughs> given by the Egyptians. Given by the Egyptians to the Israelites, Israelites before they left, and then given by the Israelites to the, Moses. To, to Moses to, to, make the, to melt down and to make this tabernacle. If you, if you think about it, they were carrying them all the time. It's yeah. just that they turned into a different form after a while, and they still carried them. Yeah. The giving was so generous that Moses finally had to tell them to stop bringing their gifts. 
Now, notice these words, battle in all white, once again, patriarchs and prophets, 347 to 349. No language can describe the glory of the scene presented within the sanctuary. All but a dim reflection of the glories of the temple of God in heaven. Imagine just the precious metals. According to Exodus 38, 24 and 25, the construction of this portable wilderness tent utilized over a ton of gold. Wow. And most of this came from jewelry? Came from jewelry. 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 Adventists need to know that. Oh, they gave up <laughs> they, their jewelry. I know, but they had jewelry before, and they gave well, it up for that. That's, that's how it came to them from the Egyptians. It was very important to the Egyptians to have Well, jewelry. they took it, so it must have been important to them, too. Well, they were told to take it. Well, they were told to take it, huh? Yeah. Okay. 29 talents, 730 shekels, equals about 2,205 pounds or 1,000 kilograms. Almost four tons of silver, 100 talents, da-da-da, 3,440 kilograms. Visualize the unsurpassed beauty of the Solomonic Temple, which Ellen White just indicates was the most magnificent structure ever reared by human hands, yet, yet only a faint reflection of the vastness and glory of the heavenly sanctuary. So now, we showed you that smaller tent tabernacle, a little, a list, a diagram of it, Think about now Solomon's temple, that's the, that's the next bigger temple. To assist your imagination, consider that in 1 Chronicles 22, 14, David collected for use in the temple 100,000 talents of gold, about 3,500 tons worth billions of U.S. dollars in today's monetary value. And one million talents of silver, about 35 thousand tons of silver. From this beautiful sanctuary we learn that one, God is a great lover of that which is beautiful, Exodus 28, 2 and 40, 2 Chronicles 3, 6, and two, God's character is revealed in the sanctuary as a beautiful, for example, His holiness. Doesn't yeah. it also tell you how many people left G Egypt? to carry all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just a few people, it was a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. But this, this is talking about Solomon's temple. Yeah. Oh, this, so this, but this, this, oh, this one. I messed up here. It was okay. a ton, of, in the wilderness, it was a ton of gold. And yeah. about four tons of silver. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I didn't catch that. What it tells me is that they had quite a knowledge of metallurgy. Yes. And then when you look at what, how the ark is made with gold rings, one, one, that would have to be uh, mixed with something else. Gold is a good electrical conductor. It's got no strength. Mm -hmm. It wears out quick. Yeah. So how are you going to carry a box like that with poles that weren't supposed to come out with gold rings? There was something yeah. else going on there. Yeah. That's a good point. In the sanctuary, which was very beautiful, for example, His Holiness, God's Holiness, was illustrated in Leviticus 19.2 and Psalm 96.9. Three, God's way of salvation was typified in the sanctuary, Psalm 77, 13. These things were stunningly beautiful. And four, he longs to give us that same beautiful character, 1 Peter 1, verse 16. So, the tabernacle was so constructed that it could be taken apart and borne with the Israelites in all of their journeyings. Now, who carried all that stuff? Levites. There was actually one section of the Levites, the Merari section of the Levites, whose job, whose primary job was to carry all that stuff when they traveled. I bet well, they were very muscular. Must I don't know. Carts. There must have been wheels. Well, they, they, there might have been carts. Probably there were carts, except for the ark. The ark was supposed to be carried on the shoulders of men and not in a cart. Um, where were they given the designation, this is the group of Levites that are to carry the temple? Right there in, in, in Exodus and Leviticus. It's spelled out. That probably means that somebody carried the Levites stuff for them. Either I that or the other, that. the other parts of the family. Yeah, there were, there were two other large sections of the family that probably carried this stuff for them. It was therefore small, 
the tent was relatively small, being no more than 55 feet in length. That doesn't seem small to me. And 18 in breadth and height. That's a good size house. Well, 55 length, that's like a, a trailer. You know, they yeah. go truck, a semi-trailer going down the road, yeah. but it's about two of them si going side by side, so that's yeah. about your size. And two more on top. Because it's just Pretty as high. Yeah. yeah. So it was a magnificent structure. The wood employed for the building and its furniture was that of the acacia tree, which was less subject to decay than any other to be obtained at Sinai. And that sanctuary, by the way, survived and was being used for four, more than 400 years. Do we still have acacia trees around? Oh, yes. Plenty of them in that part of the year. Uh, part of the world, I'm sorry. <coughs> the walls consisted of upright boards set in silver sockets and held firm by pillars and connecting bars. And all were overlaid with gold, giving to the building the appearance of solid gold. The roof was formed of four sets of curtains, the innermost of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet, with cherubim of cunning work. Just imagine blue and purple and scarlet, and there's golden woven, gold and silver woven angels in that stuff. Uh, that was covered then with goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, and seal skins to so arranged as to afford complete protection. So when there was heavy rains, which didn't happen very often in the desert, but they can be really heavy when, when they do happen, this thing was completely protected. Did you say seal skins? Yeah. Where in the desert are they? Getting no, them? they got those. They, they had to. They had to have gotten those from from the uh, from the Red Sea. They got them from the Red Sea. They had to. Dolphin skins. Yeah, it yeah. says it says they're dolphin skins as well. I never heard that before. Yeah, well, dolphin and seal. I mean, it's a you you can't tell from the Hebrew exactly what kind of a sea creature, but it's. It was maybe a seal, maybe a dolphin, maybe some of both. Well, even today, there's certain kinds of treated uh, shark skins in mm -hmm. women's purses, uh, quite yeah. something, they say. Yeah. Expensive. Well, in the first apartment, we're still talking about this, our holy place, where the, where the ta table of showbread, the candlestick or lampstand, and the altar of incense. The table of showbread stood on the north, with its ornamental crown, it was overlaid with pure gold. By the way, it's interesting to notice that if you, if you look at the, the altar, in the original sanctuary, the altar of burnt offering was here, the laver was next, and if you kept going right straight in, the lamp stand was to the left, the sh table of showbread was to the right, the altar of burnt offering, or, uh, I'm sorry, the altar of incense was right in front of you, and beyond that was the ark. What is that? What shape is that? Cross. That's a cross. Now, was a certain group given the responsibility of making the showbread? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the table of showbread stood on the north with, with its ornamental crown. It was overlaid with pure gold. On this table were, pre, were priests. Uh, the priests were each Sabbath to place 12 cakes arranged in two piles and sprinkled with frankincense. The loaves that were removed, being accounted holy, were to be eaten by the priests. Now, what does all this mean? Or are you going to get to this? <laughs> all this. I asked you. Something. I asked you earlier. Is there any place where it explains all this? And the answer is, only in the book of Hebrews, and even there, it's very brief. But the showbread is the. The word the of God. The bread is bread supposed to represent the presence of God. Yeah, and the, and, the, and the bread of life, yeah. It's, it's to be eaten. Okay. On the south was the seven branched candlestick. It wasn't really a candlestick, it was a lampstand with its seven lamps. Its branches were ornamented with exquisitely, exquisitely wrought flowers resembling lilies, and the whole was made from one solid piece of gold. And um, their estimates that it weighed 75 kilograms. That was a heavy piece of furniture. Now, did Jesus at one time in the temple say, 
I am the light of the world, yes. meaning the candlestick, yes. and I am the bread of life, yes. the, meaning the showbread. Yes. Okay. And his prayers ascended along with our prayers representing the, the, the smell that came in, in the cloud that went up with the incense and so forth and that. Yeah, all of that. Yeah. Um, by the way, just very briefly a little sidelight, that famous candlestick survived through Solomon's temple, well, through the original temp tabernacle, was that one was used in Solomon's temple. Then it was, it was carried to Babylon. It was brought back from Babylon, was used in Herod's temple for the next whatever, how many hundreds of years, and finally was taken by the Romans from the, from the tent, from the thing, uh, from the uh, Herod's temple when it was, when it was dis completely destroyed in AD 70, carried all the way to Rome, where it was, and it's, you can still see the picture of it being carried in Rome in the Ark of, uh, that's at the entrance to the Roman Forum. In Rome, it's still there. You can see the picture. I've seen it. I've taken pictures of it. And that candlestick was taken, stolen by the Vandals from North Africa when they sacked Rome and carried off into North Africa, and we don't know what happened to it after that. Wow. So that candlestick survived hundreds, thousands of years. Anyway, there being no windows in the tabernacle, the lamps were never all extinguished at one time, but shed their light by day and by night. Just before the veil separating the holy place from the most holy in the immediate presence of God stood the golden altar of incense. Upon this altar the priest was to burn incense every morning and evening. Its horns were touched with the blood of the sin offering, and it was sprinkled with blood upon the great day of atonement. The fire upon this altar was kindled by God himself and was sacredly cherished. Day and night the holy incense diffused its fragrance throughout the sacred apartments and without far around the tabernacle. That fire, in other words, was never supposed to go out. Did it ever go out? Well, not that we, not that's reported in Scripture. That again, of course, is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 348. Well, of course, when the temple was, was destroyed, yes, if you... Wasn't there a time when two guys got in trouble for bringing strange fire? I thought that they let yeah. it, two priests let it go out. Aaron's and they, sons. And no, they, they, this, uh, this didn't have anything it? to do with the, with the, with the uh, fire on the altar of incense. I don't, I don't think. They brought strange fire into the temp tabernacle, but they weren't supposed to. Right, yeah. Yeah. Well, the daily service consisted of the morning and evening burnt offering. Now we're talking about the services and so forth. The daily service consisted of the morning and evening burnt offering. One sacrifice, one lamb was offered at 9 o'clock in the morning. Another one was offered at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The offering of sweet incense on the golden altar and the special offerings for individual sins. And there were also offerings for Sabbaths, new moons, and special feasts. So what were those daily sacrifices supposed to be for? And all those Sin unintentional for. sins. <laughs> for any intentional sins for the entire <clears throat> congregation of Israel. You preceded that with un, is that correct? You unintentional yes. sins. Yeah. Yes. You have to pay it was to remind the people to, it, start, it was in the morning, it remind the people to have a good day and don't sin, don't sin anymore. Yes. Is the, Maybe, is yeah, go ahead. The, um, the daily sacrifice, um, doesn't it kind of actually mean, point to the people and say that this is how you live? Well, that would have been ideal, yes. Well, th I mean, there's, the daily sacrifice, wasn't there one in the morning and one in the evening or something? Yes. Nine o'clock I said nine o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, it's almost like there are two bookends for the whole day, if More you or look less. at it that way. Yeah. And it's it seems to point to sacrifice. I mean, yeah. sacrifice in your life, sacrifice as opposed to being selfish. Last week, just to remind those of you who maybe didn't get to get to hear us. Numbers 15, 27 to 31 have some very interesting words. If an individual sins unintentionally, he is to offer a one-year-old female goat as a sin offering. 
<coughs> At the altar, the priest shall perform the ritual of purification to purify the person from his sin, and he will be forgiven. The same regulation applies to all who unintentionally commit a sin, whether they are native Israelites or resident foreigners. But any person who sins deliberately, whether he's a native or a foreigner, is guilty of treating the Lord with contempt, and he shall be put to death because he has rejected what the Lord said and has deliberately broken one of his commands. He is responsible for his own death. So we had quite a discussion last week about uh, in intentional and unintentional sins, but now we're talking about what you deal with. These are presumably unintentional sins we're talking about here being dealt with in the sanctuary. In the offering of incense, the priest was brought more directly into the presence of God than in any other act of the daily ministration. So what are we talking about now? He would have to bring incense into the holy place, and where, where would he take it? The altar of incense. To the altar of incense, which was located just in front of the curtain between the holy place and the most holy place, right? As the inner veil of the sanctuary did not extend to the top of the building, the glory of God, which was manifested above the mercy seat, was partially visible from the first apartment. When the priest offered incense before the Lord, he looked toward the ark, and as the cloud of incense arose, the divine glory descended upon the mercy seat and filled the most holy place, and often so filled both apartments that the priest was obliged to retire to the door of the tabernacle. Patriarchs and Prophets 353. Now, what, I don't understand why is all this necessary in such a system? Is this God's way of teaching or do these things really matter? Was God well, teaching just by uh, giving examples? Clearly, he's, he, he, he's, he's saying two or three things. Now, let's see how important those things are. What did he say was the purpose for this whole thing in, in, in Exodus 25, 8? That I may dwell among you. That I may dwell among you. Now, if the priest goes in, as we just read, in the ceremony and he puts us this incense on the ins altar of incense and a go cloud goes up like this and the glory of God fills the temple so that the priest has to back out, does that impress the people who are watching that God is dwelling among them? Yes. yes. It certainly would because the people standing by the outside gate could see what was going on at least partially in, that mo in the holy place. Not the most holy place. I don't think they could see all the way through to the most holy place, but certainly they would see what was going on in the holy place. Well, one thing's for sure, when they went there to worship, it wasn't boring. No. I mean, you could, I mean, how do you worship God anyway, if not by truth, by yeah. thinking about Him or whatever, and, and all these symbols were there to contemplate. So when they come and worship, there was plenty there. Yeah. Most of the services that took place in the sanctuary involved the high priest or the priests from the tribe of Levi, but the most important part of the daily ministration was the service performed on behalf of individuals. The repentant sinner brought his offering to the door of the tabernacle and placing his hand upon the victim's head, confessed his sins thus in, in figure, transferring them from himself to the innocent sacrifice. By his own hand, he, the animal was then slain and the blood was carried by the priest into the holy place and sprinkled before the veil, behind which was the ark containing the law that the sinner had transgressed. By this ceremony, the sin was, through the blood, transferred in figure to the sanctuary. In some cases, the blood was not taken into the holy place, but the flesh was then to be eaten by the priests. As Moses directed the sons of Aaron, saying, God hath given it to you to bear the iniquity of the transgression of the congregation. Leviticus 10:17. Both ceremonies alike symbolize the transfer of the sin from the penitent to the sanctuary. Patriarchs and Prophets 354.2. Does that mean that our sins are being transferred to God 
and God is going to have to deal with our sins. They are being transferred and recorded in the record books of heaven. Being recorded in the record books of heaven. So when we go up to heaven, we're going to be able to look in those books and see everything we've done on this earth? Well, that's an area where the scriptures in Ellen White are not completely clear. And I, I'm telling you that I believe it's next week there's going to be a time when we're going to discuss that in some detail. Um, I guess I want to get past this stuff. In. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever wondered whether the children of Israel got the supplies, for, where they got the supplies, for, for example, the olive oil to keep those lamps burning for 40 years? Mm -hmm. You mean when they were in the desert? There they are out there for 40 years. Are there olive trees growing out there? Well, there were traders. Uh, there were other people out in the desert. Uh, yeah. Well, if you have God right above you, I'm sure that who was that prophet that the oil kept coming into the jar? Elijah. Elijah, yeah. So. So maybe it was miraculous oil, huh? Could have been. Yeah, the could have been. The shoes didn't wear out. The clothes didn't wear the out. The shoes didn't wear out. Where did they get the, presumably they must have had some wheat for making this bread that they were eating. And what do you suppose the bread tasted like after it been sitting out there in the hot desert for, for a whole week? Moldy. Well, it didn't have right. any. It didn't. <laughs> it didn't have any yeast in it. Well, if their clothes didn't wear out and their shoes didn't wear out, maybe the bread didn't Mold. turn either. Yeah. I always think God preserved my clothes and shoes like He did for the children in the wilderness. I hate to go shopping. Yeah. <laughs> well, we only have a short time left. I want to talk a little bit about one more important thing, and that's Solomon's great prayer, at the dedication of his temple. He suggested several things that should take place in the house of God. And I'm quoting once again, this is um, actually from our, our Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. At the dedication ceremony of the newly built temple, King Solomon offered seven kinds of specific prayers that could be offered at the temple. And these are all discussed, a discussion of 1 Kings 8, 31 to 53, and you can find uh, the same prayer more, almost word for word in Chronicles. Um, the seven functions exemplified the extensive role of the temple in the lives of the Israelites. The temple was a place for, one, seeking forgiveness, two, for oath swearing, three, for supplication when defeated. I don't know how that would apply to us today. Uh, four, for, for petitions when faded, faced with drought. Five, other disasters, whatever those might be. Six, a place for foreigners to pray. And seven, a place to petition for victory. Now, if you're, if you're planning to go out to war tomorrow, make sure you stop by the temple and pray for victory. <laughs> then the temple was intended to be a house of prayer for all the peoples. It should be evident from that, from Solomon's prayer and from the earlier comments about Moses' tent out there, that... Um, the foreigner as well as the Israelite and the entire population were encouraged to be petitioners at, um, at these tabernac this tabernacle. I'm confused. Does okay. it say that these seven kinds of prayers are the only kind of prayers you can... No, but those seem to be the ones that Solomon was most concerned about. Okay, so Solomon sought a place for those seven kind of yeah. prayers. And seeking forgiveness would be a good thing for all of us to do, I think. Mm -hmm. All of this would suggest to us that the sanctuary with its location in the middle of the camp was supposed to be the center of all activity for the children of Israel. As we know, that place of significance was later transferred to Jerusalem. In what ways could a modern Christian church fulfill a similar role? Certainly the church is supposed to be the primary place where we are to meet God. Exodus 25, 22, and Leviticus 1, 1. Do you think of your church as the center of your activities? What I have noticed in traveling around California is churches seem to be disappearing. Mm -hmm. Some, I went through several small towns, and I never did see a church. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and time's running out. <laughs> <laughs>
Do you feel like the church services and the Sabbath school services provide a real communication channel with God? We don't see the, the, the cloud of God's presence anymore. When you pray, are you honest with God? Can you feel his presence close to you? Does he speak to you through the activities and influences of the Holy Spirit? I mean, these are the things, the questions we're supposed to be asking ourselves. What about the closet of prayer? Well, you go to the closet. Is that the temple? But who? Well, that's fine. But <laughs> go, the Holy Spirit's there. Well, in the early years of David's life, after he had become a national figure and was being pursued by Saul, he wrote a famous and important psalm, Psalm 27. And I wish we had time to do so now, but we don't. I would encourage you to turn to Psalm 27 and read it. David wrote this song while hiding in the desert of En Gedi. It was at En Gedi where he actually cut off a piece of Saul's robe, and you can read about that in 1 Samuel 24, 1 through 22. And if we had time, I would show you some pictures I recently took at En Gedi. It's a beautiful place right on the border of the Dead Sea, but coming out of the high mountain, uh, several beautiful, small, but beautiful waterfalls and people love them. I mean, they travel from all over Israel and other places. And, and, and the pools at the bottom of these waterfalls are just full of people swimming and just having a great time. And it's still called the Fall of David. And there on the wall, on, still you can see on the side of the, of the, of the canyon there, where, where the, the, so the river runs through there, there are all these caves. And presumably one of those, one of those caves was where David was hiding and where Saul went in to relieve himself and so forth. So as David was running for his life and hiding in the caves of the desert, imagine his feelings as he thought about the tent tabernacle sanctuary of God. As a member of the tribe of Judah and the future king, he was not allowed to actually enter either the holy place or the most holy place. But what he did know, what do you suppose he did know about the inside? He must have had some knowledge from the from the Levites of how beautiful it was inside there. And here he is living in this God-forsaken place next to the Dead Sea in a cave. And he's writing this poem saying, I wish I could live permanently in God's house with a beautiful gold and silver and purple and scarlet and angels embroidered in the tents. Think of all that. God is a lover of beauty and goodness and holiness. And he's asking us to participate with him in all of those things. Do that this week. See you next week.